What drew me to the field are several component pieces. Uh, first and foremost is I adore surgery. It's uh, something that I take great pride in and uh, built into another domain outside of just general surgery is the fact that uh, these children, um, very resilient, uh, the challenges and the specific aspects of their tumors are a cut above from the standpoint of the level of complexity. It's something as a child I was always fascinated in. The indulgence of being focused, uh, hyper-focused, uh, the risk is extremely uh, accentuated. Um, and I like that, that kind of self-imposed challenge of getting the task done in a meaningful way. I get along with children a lot better than I get along with adults. My threshold for laughing is low. I still love chewing bubble gum. I love pizza. Um, it's a joy. It's an absolute pleasure. And, and I tell you, the, the anxiety built around what I do is lessened when you're dealing with children. You know, there are few emotions, I think, that are more powerful than a parent whose child is undergoing something that is changing in many ways or life-threatening. <music> Complex tumor, remove it, 10-hour case, child does great, they send you their high school graduation photo or something beyond that, that that's an amazing, amazing and powerful you know, drive here. If you go to the community of families who have lost children, if you go to the community of oncologists who have beaten their heads against the wall trying to find effective therapy, there's a desperation and a willingness to be highly adventurous. Not sloppy, but adventurous and thoughtful. It's a rare tumor. Fortunately, it's a rare cancer, it's a malignancy. It afflicts children almost exclusively. Uh, median age is somewhere around seven to 10 years of age. And it exists in a part of the brain called the pons, that it's not a small focal tumor one can take out surgically. It grows within the normal substrate in the cellular architecture of the brainstem. So surgical excision is not an option. What we used in this phase one study is what's called a monoclonal antibody, which is a very large protein structure. It's never gonna get into the brain tissue through a systemic route of delivery. The results of our phase one study have afforded me a lot of enthusiasm to continue down this path because anecdotally along the way, for a cancer that has 0% survival, median survival of nine to 11 months, you know, I now have three kids that we've treated that are three years out, six years out and one going on our 11th anniversary. This to me is unbelievably powerful, motivational. The, the next element of this from the standpoint of a clinical trial is what drug, who are we gonna partner with, what patients will we treat versus all inclusive. Um, and you use those to some degree to achieve one thing and that is are you changing the eventual outcome and the survival of this cancer? The challenge to me has never been greater from the standpoint of demonstrating success, that we shift from safety to now benefit, clinical benefit. A couple very interesting engineering and innovative aspects that have afforded neurosurgeons to use laser through a technology referred to as laser interstitial thermal therapy. Now we're exploring the use of laser for curable tumors in kids that are deep-seated and otherwise no-go zones for neurosurgeons. So what this technology allows is a fiber that's passed into the midst of these tumors, much like direct drug delivery, but now we're not injecting drugs, we're using laser to emit thermal energy increases the temperature, and we kill those cells. So cooling of these fibers through technology have been phenomenally um, revolutionary. Interarterial chemotherapy for retinoblastoma is now adopted worldwide as a means for salvaging the globe or the eye. Where can we leverage that concept in the brain? So what if we did what we did in retinoblastoma with these high-grade malignancies and infused chemotherapy to shrink the tumor, reduce the blood flow, and successfully get them through surgery. We just launched this clinical trial for infants with choroid plexus carcinoma, never been done before, 
using this paradigm. I have such faith in it. You know, that's why it's exciting, because uh, you expect it's going to demonstrate what you hypothesized. Working at a place like New York Presbyterian, while Cornell, has afforded me a, a liberty of thought from the standpoint of being creative, from the standpoint of having the support of leadership behind me. So I'm aligned with really good collaborators, uh, extremely good scientists, and this is not just limited to New York Presby and Walla Cornell, but a worldwide community of investigators.